in webinar series on infection control in your green cleaning program. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Chicago, and hopefully you're having some nice weather where you are located today. Uh, but thank you for taking the time for joining us and for learning and sharing information on green cleaning and your infection control program. This is part of the Healthy Schools Campaign 2012 Green Cleaning Webinar Series. We, this is the second of five webinars we're doing. Um, we have done Learn from the Leaders and today Infection Control. Coming up on August 7th, American School and University Green Cleaning Award. We'll be discussing um, strategies for applying and, and any information and Q&A on that. On August 15th, we'll be talking about new technology and green cleaning. And then on August 29th, financial case for green cleaning in your school. Oops. Thank you. And those are the dates. Uh, all right. And now I'd like you to all make sure you are part of the conversation. Of course, when you're here, we're going to have some Q&A, and you can ask questions in the box um, through the webinar tool on your screen. But also, feel free to follow us on Twitter. Follow Healthy Schools Campaign for the latest. Um, you can also tweet using Green Clean 2012 as a hashtag. Share your thoughts, and we'll be sure to share and reply and answer as many questions as we can. Today's webinar uh, is going to run about an hour. There, there will be a recording of the webinar that we will make available on our website after uh, or afterwards, I should say, later this week. It will be made available along with copies of this presentation. So don't worry. You will all get copies of it, and you'll get an email to a link later in the week. Also, at the end of the webinar, um, when you exit, there will be a short two-minute survey. I believe there might be two questions in it. We would love to get your answers. Please take the time to help us make sure we're doing a better job next time. Uh, also, as I mentioned, there will be a Q&A session at the final 15 minutes. Please ask questions through the uh, question box on your screen. You can ask them at any point and we will get to them at the last portion of our presentation. Uh, so a little bit about today's speakers. Uh, the first one is me, Mark Bishop with Healthy Schools Campaign. We will also have Mervyn Brewer from Salt Lake City School District, Deborah Safford from Green Chimney Schools. Um, I will give them full introductions in a short way just before they present, but what, we should, what I would like to share about both of them is both Mervyn and Deborah are award winners of the American School and University Healthy Schools Campaign and Green Cleaning Network, Green Cleaning Award for Schools and Universities, meaning they have been recognized as being some of the best of the best green cleaning programs. We're proud to have them and excited to have them be part of our webinar series. And we hope that the schools out there, the distributors out there, manufacturers out there will apply for the award for yourself, for your clients, for schools. Uh, and make sure that you're bringing recognition of the importance of green cleaning to your communities as well as sharing it with us to share across the country. Um, before we, before I fully get started, I just want to ask a quick question. So I have a poll for you. Now the question is, what is the most important part of a green infection control strategy? Um, hand washing, education, comprehensive green cleaning program, purchasing least toxic chemicals or other? We would love to hear your answer. And please take a few moments to, to vote. You've got about 15 more seconds to click that button. 10 more seconds. It's a quick 10 seconds. All right, and we're going to, oh, you're going fast. Click, click, click. OK, so let's close the poll right now. Hand washing recognized as the most important thing, 41%, followed by the green cleaning program, education, and toxic chemicals. Well, it seems like we, what I would have been have is a very informed audience. Thank you for sharing. Now, I am going to keep going on. Let me tell you a little bit about Healthy Schools Campaign. For those of you who are new, Healthy Schools Campaign is a non-for-profit. We're located in Chicago, Illinois, but we are our programs are national in scope. We work on that intersection in the school environment where we work on environment and health issues under a common sense, what we consider to be a common sense notion that a healthy student is going to be a more successful student. Uh, since 2006, we have been very actively putting our green cleaning work in trying to get schools to adopt healthier cleaning practices with the publication of our Quick and Easy Guide to Green Cleaning in Schools, where we focus on education of school stakeholders, engagement with audiences, 
We have our website, newsletters, promotions. We do speaking engagements, all about trying to get the word out about green cleaning. And along with um, us, we have a lot of partnering organizations because we realize we can't do it alone. But we work with over 25 or 30 national um, uh, education organizations to help us extend our message and to make sure that we are really reaching the broadest audience possible with our message of healthy and sustainable cleaning programs. So what is green cleaning? Um, how we define green cleaning as a healthy school campaign is cleaning to protect health without harming the environment. And this is actually a very simple yet very important and profound definition. And it has particular importance as we're talking infection control. And the, the definition is very deliberate in its order. We talk about cleaning to protect health. And that is always what a cleaning program is about. We don't clean our schools to have um, shiny floors or to impress our next visitors. That just happens to be a byproduct of what we're doing. What we want to do is clean to protect health in the same way that hospitals clean to protect their occupant health. We want to clean because we want to make sure that our schools are doing what their primary mission is. And their primary mission is to educate the children. And to do that, we need teachers attentive and in the classroom. We need students coming back to school every day and to be able to be focused and ready to learn. And then on top of that, a green cleaning program, we're going to take an additional step to not harm the environment. And that is defined in both the indoor environment as well as the broader external environment. So we want to make steps to have a small footprint so we have a healthier environment to pass down to our children, but also so the indoor environment is, it has a lower load of toxic chemicals and harmful um, um, items that potentially uh, have a negative impact on our students and staff health. And why do we focus on schools? a healthy school campaign. I, I mean, besides the name, uh, we look at schools because education is a priority. It is a priority at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, and at the fam family level. We all have an incredible um, investment and invested interest in making sure our schools succeed from promoting our um, broader economy to make sure our children are successful in their lives. We have billions of dollars invested in our school facilities. Um, nationwide, and we have a responsibility to make sure we are maintaining those buildings adequately. Um, the, the second point is because many people close together. Schools are different than the rest of our buildings. We treat them differently. We use them differently. We don't see off many office buildings that we will pack 25, 30 small bodies into small rooms. And there are very special needs that schools have that are particular to a school other than you know, that are different from a standard office building or even a home. And the third reason of why we focus on schools is because kids are more susceptible and they have different behaviors. They are more susceptible to toxins in the environment. They have a higher ratio of um, their, their, their body mass is lower and they have higher ratios of breathing and ingesting items to, to their body mass, which means things affect them more. They have less developed immunity systems, which means their bodies are less able to react to toxins that would get into their bodies. And they have different behaviors where they play around in the mud all day and bring those the mud, the pollen, the dirt, the germs into the school with them, which is something we don't do when we're in our office all day. They also have children have a tendency, or at least my child has a tendency, of picking things up and licking them and putting things into ears, mouths, and noses. And that's something that we have to pay attention to. And we have to take care of our building and our kids and be even more vigilant for this reason. So a little bit about infection control now. Um, so because I can control in many ways. And we, in a Healthy Schools campaign, we think about infection control from a holistic perspective. A, a number of years ago, I was at a, a, at a conference. And it was right around there was a major SARS outbreak. And I never forget being a fly in the wall and overhearing a number of distributors talking. And their conversation basically went along the lines of, wow, I was able to sell so many products at the SARS outbreak, and I was able to get, I really made a kill, and I made a ton of sales for my schools when that, uh, when that came out. And that, that saddened me tremendously, and it gave me a further incentive to really educate on what infection control means. Um, outbreaks of infectious disease in schools, they often, as I just mentioned, ignite a rush to purchase more and more products and trying to create germ-free schools. 
Um, in, in many cases, um, there are regulations that specifically require us to use specific products, which are uh, very frequently bleach, um, and that we may must use from a regulatory perspective. However, we have to remember that using disinfectants and sanitizers is only the final step in an infection control program. Schools can prevent bad press in the community as well as the unnecessary purchase of products by developing a proactive strategy to contain risks on a going basis. So from our perspective, the first priority is to address hygiene best practices and educate students and staff on how they can help prevent the spread of disease. Second, through, um, through a thorough green cleaning program that's executed by trained cleaning, cleaning crews, we, are a, we should be able to mitigate many of the potential problems on a daily basis. And finally, a proper disinfection strategy aimed at high-risk areas should be able to ensure that schools can stay healthy and open for classes, even during periods that are extra concern. So I would like to, um, so I would like to take a moment, and I will go into uh, a little bit of detail on these three before we uh, go on. Um, infection control uh, in education. Um, the first step towards an infection control strategy is to educate everyone about how diseases are spread. Ultimately, school officials should empower individuals to understand their roles in containing outbreaks. There are roles for students, there are roles for parents, there are roles for teachers, school nurses, custodial staff, and we all have this important part of the puzzle. Students and staff who are feeling sick should be sent home. There's just no question that we have to educate parents um, to, to understand the importance of why students need to stay home. We have to educate our children to understand that they have to communicate to their teachers, the school nurse, and to the parents when they are not feeling well. Um, students, teachers, coaches, school staff also must be educated about the importance of personal hygiene, hand washing. Um, many studies have recently shown that through proper hand hygiene, schools can actually decrease student absentee. Students and staff should also be educated about respiratory hygiene. Uh, yeah, this received a lot of press recently during uh, some recent outbreaks. But reminding people covering their hands and mouth with a tissue, coughing into their sleeve, this can truly avoid spewing contagious germs into the air, as simple as it seems. Um, CDC has developed some excellent resources shown online are shown online. Shown, uh, shown on the screen are at least three resources, Scrub Club, itsasnap.org, as well as the CDC website. These all have excellent resources. Um, that you can download and you can share with your schools. Additionally, uh, school nurses can play an important role, and they must play an important role in developing hygiene education plans for their schools. Schools and staff should be trained to comply with standard procedures. Um, schools are really key in providing education awareness uh, and, and support in the school setting to, you know, for this area of, of, of engagement and recognition of the importance of infection control. Um, I would encourage everyone to visit the National Association of School Nurses, their website. I, I believe we're about to push out a, web, a, a website for them. Um, they have excellent resources that you can download. Um, whether you're a school nurse or a school staff, you can download these, um, check them, and bring them back to your school. The second part that we talk about is cleaning. I'm not going to go into detail about cleaning um, because our next two presenters are, is, is, this is essentially what they will be discussing. But by following a, a, a thorough green cleaning program, such as our Healthy School Campaign Quick and Easy Guide to Green Cleaning in School, a your school should be in position to handle outbreaks because the building is already being maintained according to best practices that prioritize health and safety. A well-run green cleaning program involves staff training on how to use chemicals. And, and the reality is that cleaning properly with green chemicals, with friction, with water-based equipment, it can greatly reduce the school's need to panic when infections do um, break out. Uh, and then I also want to say I, I must speak a little bit about choosing disinfectants. And again, I'm just touching on this very briefly, and if there are questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A. But there are green definitions for disinfectants and for sanitizers. Um, and so, and because there's no simple way of identifying what is a preferable disinfectant, there are at least some things that we can look to. And the things that we look to are low toxicity. So when you look at the MSDS sheets, look for category four, which are least toxic, as opposed to category one being the most toxic. Um, look for concentrates rather than ready-to-use products. By having concentrates, 
we were able to reduce the, the you know, reduce the footprint for transportation, for water use, and packaging, and can lower the overall impact, environmental impact of fish that we're choosing. Look for ones that are neutral pH, so they're going to have lower impact on um, potential human exposures, but also are going to be less abrasive to the surfaces and finishes in our school, so we're maintaining our buildings better. Look for ones that have no fragrance. Um, you know, disinfectants don't need to have fragrances, um, don't serve any functional purpose in the terms of disinfecting. Um, so this is one area where we can reduce an exposure without reducing any form of, um, any, any, any form of functionality. Look for VOC and look for flashpoint issues as well, because both of these are very important for uh, identifying products that have health, better health um, profiles. In addition to the actual products, we want to look at the equipment that we're looking because um, development and cleaning technology have really made the cleaning process easier and also more effective. We want to do things that are going to reduce the um, potential for cross-contamination, looking at microfiber systems that don't use buckets and use sprayers by looking at dual bucket systems that, that segment the dirty water from the clean water. So we're not cleaning rooms, we're not cleaning um, uh, buildings with dirty um, water that's potentially spreading disease. We can also look to vapor technologies that disinfect and sanitize without the use of harmful technology, um, harmful chemicals. Um, and, and then you also have to remember that it's not just about what you purchase, but how you use it, whether it's the equipment or the or the chemicals. And we have to make sure that we're using processes that again reduce the cross contamination. Uh, by looking at color-coded mops, color-coded wiping cloths, so we know where and what we are using and that we are not continuing to spread germs. Considering vacuums over dust mops, so we're not just spreading the dust and potential germs around, but we're actually, actually capturing them. And also, um, also, let's make sure that when we are using disinfectants, we're using them appropriately and we're looking at proper dwell time. So we have chemicals that are actually um, you know, we look at the recommendations and if they say a one to five to ten minute dwell time for proper effectiveness that we use that because otherwise if we don't, we're not getting the effectiveness of the product but yet we still have the exposure. So we want to make sure that when we use them, we use them properly so they actually work the way we want them to work. All right, thank you for hearing me out there. I am about to introduce our first speaker. Um, or I should say our second speaker, Mervyn Brewer. But before we do, I'd like to take a quick poll. Make sure you guys are all still paying attention. You're all out there. So what do you perceive as being the biggest barrier to green infection control? Please answer the question. While you do, I'm going to introduce Mervyn. Mervyn Brewer is an assistant custodial supervisor for the Salt Lake City School District. He has worked for 33 years and was an elementary and high school head custodian for 10 of those years. During Mr. Brewer's tenure as supervisor, he has been a key member in building the custodial department's green cleaning program for which the Salt Lake City School District, uh, for the Salt Lake City School District, um, won the American School and University Award for Best Green Cleaning Program. Mr. Brewer is also one of three supervisors for the school district's IPM program, um, and in 2008, Salt Lake City was was the 28th school district in the nation awarded the EPA's IPM STAR certification for their integrated pest management program. So let's take a look at what's the answers to our question. What do you perceive as being the biggest barrier? And the number one answer was lack of understanding of infection control basics of 88%. So that wasn't even close. So let's go back and say welcome Mervyn to us. And Mervyn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Let me, uh, next slide, please. Let me tell you a little bit about the Salt Lake City School District. There are 36 schools in our district. And in May of 1999, a 10-year construction program was begun to build schools that were safer, brighter, and can be used more as community centers after hours. Our students hail from all around the world. 53% uh, of our students are of ethnic minority descent. The district serves a significant refugee population. Approximately 60% of our students come from low-income families, and just over 33% of them are learning English as a second language. The school employs approximately 2,840 people and has approximately 2,400 2, students. 
and over 80 languages are spoken in the halls of Salt Lake City schools. Next slide, please. So what's our direction? Our green cleaning initiatives are to create a team environment that is conducive to learning yet provides a level of protection for the occupant's health while reducing impacts on the environment. We believe in pursuing an effective approach to cleaning for health that relies on the use of easy to follow cleaning uh, practices united with the use of current green technologies and employee training that will allow us to also be environmentally sensitive. Next slide, please. Some interesting tidbits about uh, schools related to health and cleaning. 25% of the nation spends their entire day in school or in a school. And bleach, while being a good disin, uh, disinfectant, is often misused by cleaning personnel. It's frequently improperly diluted, improperly labeled, or mixed with other chemicals that can cause uh, dangerous gases. And in Salt Lake City in 1901, there was a diphtheria and smallpox outbreak. In our school, medical officers responded by spraying classrooms with books and, and books with formaldehyde gas. Can you imagine that? Next slide, please. So back in the day, before we were green, we thought we were doing pretty well. We used to use bleach four times a week in our restrooms, and we would use a quaternary disinfectant once a week in our restrooms, and it was usually applied by a sponge or a rag or a toilet swab. And you'll also notice that uh, quite often our custodians didn't wear gloves. Next slide, please. Also back in the day, we would use part-time poorly trained sweepers, which were usually used on their first jobs ever to clean restrooms. Restroom doors were uh, cleaned every year, or excuse me, classroom doors were cleaned every year when the rest of the room was cleaned. And latex gloves were used extensively by the cleaning staff. Next slide, please. Also back in the day, Carpets were cleaned once a year with a bonnet and buffer method. Biological events were cleaned up using a dry powder and sweep method. Next slide, please. So back in the day, uh, we used toxic chemicals that were poorly applied. We did a lot of crap across contaminating by unvested, poorly trained employees. We were uh, playing into people with latex allergies. We were creating sticky floors and unpleasant odors. Next slide, please. So where are we today? Since September 2008, full-time career employees clean the restrooms and locker rooms. Hydrogen peroxide-based cleaners are used four times a week. A shotgun cleaning of the restrooms is performed at least once a week with a disinfectant. A new technology we are beginning to implement this year is the use of touch-free cleaning we can only afford to do a few of them per year as for our budgetary uh, restraints. But these are used once a week to clean in our restrooms. We use foaming hand soap in our restrooms nowadays. Proper hand hygiene is critical, as was stressed earlier in the presentation. And it's stressed highly by our teaching staff and our administrators with the students. Next slide, please. Since September of 2008, high traffic doors and walls are wiped daily. Hard surface cleaners are hydrogen peroxide based. Spray bottles of peroxide based cleaners are provided to all classroom teachers for daily test, uh, desk cleaning. Foaming spray heads are used to reduce uh, atomization of chemicals that uh, the users can ingest. Microfiber rugs are used. All cleaning operations are done with the use of nitrile gloves, and non-alcohol-based foaming hand sanitizer is provided in all cafeterias, daycare areas, and severely handicapped units. Next slide, please. Today, with our carpet cleaning, all carpets are cleaned by the use of a truck-mounted carpet extractor, so they can be much deeper cleaned than we used to do. Kindergartens daycares and special need classrooms are cleaned on a quarterly basis instead of annually as it was in the past. Biological events are extracted immediately. Bacteria eating enzymes are used in this process. Next slide please. So what do we do when there's an outbreak? 
high-risk times? Well, we keep a stock of instant kill claim disinfectant on hand that is ready to, de to be deployed at uh, any hot spot where there is an outbreak at a moment's notice. The, important, the most important thing for us is high visibility, PR, and immediate response. It's very, very critical at this time. Remember that we keep doing what we're already doing. For us, every time is a high-risk time. But keep in mind that when there is an outbreak, we change our priorities just a little bit. We do less aesthetical cleaning, such as burnishing floors, cleaning outside windows, and we stress with our people uh, more health-oriented cleaning, such as wiping down touch and again, being very visible to the public so that they can see that we are out there making a, a very uh, in-your-face effort to try and control these, uh, these critical outbreaks. Next slide, please. Used to be back in the day, uh, district-wide communication wasn't very good. We, we had pagers. So if we wanted to get a hold of one of our schools, we would page them and they would call us back their earliest convenience. Or if they had an outbreak in their school, they'd email us or call us in our office and leave a message and let us know there was a problem. Next slide, please. Today, we have instant two-way communication with all of our custodial staff across the district. Email is an important part of our communication, as well as having well-trained computer literate custodians. If they do have a problem in their building, they can get on the internet, and they can look up answers as quickly as, as we can. So it makes it a, a lot easier to have these people who are highly trained in computer literate. We have a shared intranet where we can actually put uh, specific bulletins online that can be read by our custodians on how to deal with certain, um, certain outbreaks and certain problems. We also have security cameras throughout our buildings that make it a lot easier for us to uh, track and to follow and to direct an incident that may be occurring in the school. Next slide, please. Custodial training is key to our cleaning program. Our custodians receive quarterly training in the latest cleaning methods, chemical changes, IPM measures, and indoor air quality updates. Next slide, please. IPM training. One of, the, uh, one of the things we usually don't think about in infection control is pest control. Rodents, roaches, and other pests can carry pathogens. Part of an effective strategy, uh, infection control strategy, is prevention. Keeping pest habitation in the building under control is key. An effective integrated pest management strategy is a key component to this, as well as an added benefit of not using poison, uh, pesticide, around our school environment. Next slide, please. So what have we done? Well, in our school, the risk of exposure to pathogens carried by pests has greatly been reduced. Preventive measures are taken in the classrooms daily by our custodians by the teachers and by the students. This has been going on for the last seven years. And an added benefit is a reduction in pesticide use in our schools by over 98%. What a great benefit. Because as we talk so much about using green chemicals as part of our green cleaning process, many programs quite often in schools continue to use poisons, pesticides, in schools to prevent pests. Next slide, please. And that's all I have about our infection control strategy. Great. Thank you so much, Mervyn. One of the things that's so exciting for me to see is how when, when Mervyn, as well as uh, when we have Deborah speak, um, when they speak about their infection control strategies, it really goes hand in hand with the green cleaning strategy. It's hard to pull apart where one starts and one ends. Um, and, and, and thinking about cleaning for health and what that really means for the quality of the cleaning that we're going to be providing, as well as our ability to reduce the exposures to, to chemicals. So uh, having said that, I would like to introduce our next speaker now.
Um, our next speaker is Deborah Stafford, who's a director of housekeeping at Jean Chin Green Chimney Schools in New York. Uh, Deb is, um, uh, she began working there in 2000, and she's currently leading Green Chimney's Green Cleaning Initiative. Green Chimney Schools is world-renowned for its animal-assisted therapy program, residential treatment center for children, accredited special education school, farm and wildlife rehabilitation center, outreach, and more. Always an environmentalist, Deb utilized her experience and knowledge to transform the housekeeping department's standard use of and other toxic chemicals into a more environmental, sustainable, healthier, and green housekeeping department. So, Deborah, I thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you. So, it's all yours. Deborah, we may have lost Deborah. It looks like Deb is still, but Deborah may have dropped off the line. And so let's take a moment and see. We're going to wait for Deborah to see if she comes back. And in the meantime, do we have any questions that have come in yet? So, um, so Alex, so, so I'm going to ask my colleague Alex Seidel to um, just go through some of the questions that we have. And if Deborah gets back on, we will bring her back. So, Alex. Great. So, Mervyn, we did have a few questions come in for you while um, you were speaking, so I'm just going to go ahead and ask them of you. Um, first, uh, can you provide a little more detail about what you mean by the shotgun approach? You used that term in your slide and had a number of questions come in about that. Oh, thank you for asking. The uh, shotgun approach, as we call it, is, as we tell our custodians, is where we will use something like a touch-free cleaning machine or we'll use a foaming, uh, a foaming gun hooked to a hose and place a disinfectant in there. And we will spray the entire restroom, top to bottom, uh, walls, doors, um, floor, every nook and cranny we can actually get to. This will get to place in the restroom that we normally couldn't clean with our normal cleaning operation. And so this shotgun approach is the best possible way that we can think of to get every nook and cranny uh, cleaned uh, within a within a restroom or within a locker room. Okay, let's just take a real quick. Um, Deborah, Deborah, are you back on the line? Okay, we'll just we'll see if we can clear up your audio in just a moment. Okay, so Mervyn, another question for you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about foaming sprayer heads? and how you, what they are and how you use them in your program. Yes, the uh, usual spray head that comes on a spray bottle, as you know, um, when you pull the trigger, it, it uh, atomizes the product that's in the spray bottle. Well, how often do you use a product and you can smell it or it uh, causes you to sneeze? And so one thing that we have implemented is a spray head, a uh, a trigger spray head that has a foaming, it has a cone on it that causes the product to foam versus to, to fully atomize. This Excuse me, Murph, I think I'm back online, I'm hoping. Oh, okay. Am I here? Yes, you yeah. are. We'll, we'll get back to you after, after this question. Continue. Very good. Uh, what that does is it reduces the amount of atomization for the user to be breathing in. And as a custodian who's worked for over 30 years, uh, I can tell you I've breathed in a lot of uh, chemicals over the years, if that's not already evident. But uh, we would like to keep the, uh, the air quality um, for those in that environment at a healthier level. And so that's why we use those foaming spray heads. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Great, and now we're going to go to uh, Deborah Stafford from Green Chimney School. So, Deborah, please, uh, the floor is all yours. I apologize for that. I could hear you guys, but I guess you couldn't hear me. So, I want to thank you very much, Mark, and thanks for the chance to share what we know with all of you. First, let me begin by sharing with our unique educational environment. Uh, Green, here at Green Chimneys, our mission is to restore possibilities and create futures for children with emotional, behavioral, social, and learning challenges. We have close to 200 students ranging from the ages of 5 to 18. They come to Green Chimneys from over 50 surrounding school districts. We are about 60 miles New York City, but have a rural country landscape. 
Most of the students are dealing with psychosocial disabilities such as Asperger's, reactive attachment disorder, anxiety, depression, and oppositional defiance disorder. Our special education school program is unique. We have a farm, a horse barn, and organic garden that are all part of our successful therapeutic animal-assisted therapy and nature-based programs we provide. We believe working with animals is a way for emotionally injured children to open up, connect, and heal. The nature of our business also means we are exposed to germs. Lots of them. Next slide, please. The campus itself consists of more than 30 buildings, each requiring different levels of cleaning and disinfecting. Next slide, please. Our green cleaning policy is enforced throughout all of these buildings, from the health center to the dining hall to the school to the offices to the gym and the pool. For, uh, for example, some buildings are staffed by adults in their own offices and their own personal desks, computers, and phones. That's not much germ sharing there. On the other hand, no pun intended, areas such as the gym, pool, locker room, building are highly visited throughout the day. Next slide, please. Students practice yoga and play basketball in the gym. The pool provides swimming lessons not only for students, but also for our Nature's Nursery Child Care Program, as well as the public. The local high school swim team meets here in the morning for practice and will often have swim meets here. There is a lot of opportunity for infections to travel from person to person, on surfaces and even airborne. To combat these areas of concern, the gym floor is cleaned using a Tenant Echo 3 floor scrubber machine. It has a, is, uses a new technology uh, that uses kinetically charged water ions without any chemicals. We can um, get that done in 15 minutes compared to using the mop and bucket, which is definitely something that is old school in my, my ideas. Um, we also use have pool towels that the students use, and uh, they are laundered with a high-efficiency hydrogen peroxide detergent in our commercial laundry, which is in the same building. And they are laundered after each use. Um, and of course, we target high-touch areas throughout the day. Next slide, please. Most of the other programs, such as the farm and organic garden, are very proactive with proper hand hygiene guidelines. And we provide green sealed certified soaps at the multiple sink sites spread throughout campus. But students do not stay in one classroom. They travel to the library and the dining hall, as most students do. But the favorite place for them to go is the farm. Here, students have hands-on experiences with the animals, feed them, and take care of them by helping to keep the stalls and cages clean. We have horses, cows, big pigs, little pigs, injured birds, chickens, several llamas, and even two camels. Thorough hand hygiene is paramount, and it is considered part of the program curriculum in these many areas. Next slide, please. So what happens when it is a flu season or there is an outbreak? Do our cleaning procedures change, or does the need to protect students and staff from infectious disease supersede the demand for green cleaning? Well, because we are proactive in our daily routine all necessary, of all necessary areas, we have found that should an outbreak occur, the most effective solution is to redirect staff to those areas and buildings that require a higher level of disinfection, such as the dining hall, the gym pool building, and the health center. We manage this process and procedure compliance by using professionally designed health and safety audits. These audits are monitored by educational, residential, and administrative team leaders, and we assure that we are proactively following proper procedures. We have also found that custodians and janitors are very vested in the outcomes of their work, and training helps them to be the experts in the field. Next slide, please. Some of the facts regarding flu outbreaks and other infectious diseases. Uh, flu viruses can survive 8 to 12 hours on paper or cloth. That includes a paper towel thrown on the floor. 24 to 48 hours on non-porous surfaces, 72 hours on wet surfaces. Additionally, adults can infect others one day before they even develop symptoms and up to one week after becoming sick. Children can be contagious for several weeks. So you can see why it's imperative to practice some of this infection control plan on a regular daily basis. So 
also this means viruses can remain contagious overnight in an improperly cleaned office or school. During an outbreak, the steps in our control plan include increased sanitizing of all doors, light switches, phones, faucets, keyboards, and the like. This is often done more than three times a day. Because these surfaces are kept clean, spraying high touch points with disinfectant and leaving it to air dry for the proper dwell time will minimize the prevalence of germs. However, merely applying a disinfectant is not a substitute for cleaning. Federal law requires those surfaces being treated as to disinfect as being cleaned first. And we know blue is not part of a green cleaning program. While bleach is sometimes used, not here at Green Chimneys, we outlawed bleach. Um, it does not clean, is highly corrosive to metals, and is hazardous to skin, mucous membranes, and the respiratory system. And some people tend to say, well, bleach is cheap. It's a cheap way for us to disinfect. But you have to use so much more bleach to equal the equal dilution of a more friendlier uh, quaternary disinfectant. You might, you might have to use four, five, six times the amount of bleach. So you're really just being more toxic using that bleach. And you're not saving any money because you're using um, that much more of it to get the same results. An interesting fact is that most disinfectants are listed as pesticides. They are intentionally toxic to microorganisms, and currently none can be third-party certified. Any such claim violates EPA and FTC regulations. As Merv was saying earlier, we also routinely use hydrogen peroxide cleaner, and that can be a sanitizer in as quick as 30 seconds to one minute. And that has a kill claim, including MRSA, flu, and rhinovirus, among other flus. We regularly use a quaternary formula in our health center environment and our higher use areas, such as the locker engine. Next slide, please. During the times when outbreaks and illness increase, our strategy is to redirect trained staff to these high use areas and to use less resources at the office areas. Because we have maintained a high level of cleanliness, this redirection of resources does not affect our visual cleanliness. The specifics regarding this strategy include having custodial staff familiar with the, each of the program areas heighten their infection control by hitting high-touch critical control points. That would mean the, the people that are regularly at the farm and cleaning the farm will know where children are most of the time and where the high critical control point, points are. So I staff the farm with those people. The same with the dining hall, the people that are regularly in that building um, they are also charged with maintaining the, the infection control plan and uh, on and on. Because the staff are familiar with the, the program area, be it the farm, computer lab, or dining hall on a daily basis, they can concentrate on the more risky touch points, such as computers, light switches, door handles, water fountains, railings, lockers, and other areas kids tend to gravitate to. Next slide, please. So I know we've gone over some things really quickly, uh, so just a quick review. Um, at, here at Green Chimneys, we use Green Seal certified products every day and continue that practice during an infe infectious disease outbreak. The only thing we do different at that time is allocate personnel to high-risk areas and add a, target, a, and add a quaternary disinfectant to our arsenal. Um, we reduce some of the pro procedures such as dusting and detail vacuuming, um, as Murph said, buffing of the floors and some of those other visual uh, tasks. We strictly rely on our staff and their microfiber cloths and um, proper use of the products and the dilution ratios and procedures to make sure things are done properly. Um, again, we use microfiber cloths and mops, and um, because we have a co commercial laundry here, it does make it very easy for us to launder all of our um, reusable things quite often. And training our custodial staff is key. Next slide, please. So in the end, by enforcing prevention, the education of proper hand hygiene and cleaning procedures, and executing a, executing a specific infection control plan enables us to minimize the spread of infection, even in such a varied and diverse campus here at Green Chimneys. If you'd like some more information, please visit our website at greenchimneys.org. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deb. Sorry about the technical staff, but that was fabulous.
Uh, All right. We're going to uh, enter into the Q&A session in just a moment. Uh, but before I do, I first want to say, I mentioned this earlier, but the uh, we are now open to accepting awards for the Green Cleaning Awards for school and universities held jointly by American School and University, Healthy School Campaign, and the Green Cleaning Network. Uh, we hope, if, again, if you're a school and if you have a program that wants to be recognized, please apply. If you are a distributor, please work with your schools and apply on behalf of your schools that are doing excellent work. If you're a manufacturer, reach out to your distributors and tell them to get their schools applied so you can be recognized along with your school. We want to make sure that uh, we recognize the best schools that are out there. The due date for our applications is September 7th. So please check out asumagazine.com, Green Cleaning Awards, for more information. Uh, before we go to the, uh, the, the Q&A, we have one more quick poll I would like to ask you all. Uh, it, it may look uh, repetitive, but we're just, we are just want to see what you guys think. What do you now believe is the most important part of a green infection control strategy? And once we're done with this, we will move on to Q&A for the second time. So we've got about 10 seconds, so take a quick time to vote. It is also about 10, 12 minutes to the hour, so we have a lot of questions that we're going to get started on real soon. So I hope you're going to take the time to stick along with us. So we have the votes. Hand washing, 29%, 29% a comments of green cleaning program, 54%. So there was a little bit of change in perception and from, from, our, uh, from, from the information that we shared. Excellent. So, having said that, we are now on the Q&A section. Alex Scheibel is going to start um, going through the questions. And if you have a question later, don't be to tweet it to green, with a hashtag of GreenClean2012. So, Alex, all yours. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to our speakers for giving great presentations. Mervyn, we actually had follow-up questions based on the two questions we asked earlier. So, I was going to kick it off with those. Um, we have people wanting to know where do you find the equipment that you use for your shotgun approach and for the foaming spray head? Our local vendors uh, carry both. There are several different uh, companies that make the uh, um, sorry the uh, the foaming spray guns. Uh, some of them are proprietary to um, their uh, disinfectant products. But uh, we just go to our local vendors to get uh, to get those things. Great, some thank of, you. Some and, of the bigger just, companies, some of the bigger companies um, that are, are using a lot of the no-touch systems are um, Kyvac, uh, Kyvac machines here. And yes, they are expensive, but they save in labor and are uh, really help the people get their job done correctly. Um, Kyvac, Tenant, uh, Echo. Those are some good quality machines to look into. But I, I, would, I would encourage everyone to reach out to your distributor because they should be a wealth of knowledge. And they, Definitely. Um, yeah, and I'm sure that they have products and equipment that can comply with uh, green cleaning recommendations generally and specific needs as well. So, Great, thank you. And then a question for both Mervyn and Deb. Um, what metrics do you use to determine the benefits of green cleaning program? And can you speak to the impact that your program has had based on those metrics? Well, I know that we sent out a um, Survey Monkey survey to uh, the whole campus and had different program areas um, or I was able to dive to which program area a person was in by their um, building number. So even though it was an anonymous survey, I still could at least figure out what area and what type of cleaning we were doing in that area. And close to 88% said that they were uh, that they were very happy with the green cleaning environment and that they had noticed so many different changes in themselves, their own asthma reduction, um, not having the smell of bleach everywhere. It, it just was surprising to see what a, what a positive um, survey results that were that came back. Uh, hey, hey, Deb, would you be willing to share the, sur the, uh, the survey tool that you use so other people may be able to use it? Um, yeah, um, yeah, I could look into that. Uh, we went on SurveyMonkey, and I just put in some of my, you know, the basic questions, um, housekeeping metric questions. How, how often do you think 
you need to be done, your desk needs to be dusted. How, how do you feel about the green cleaning policy? Do you have questions? So I can, um, I can jot some of those questions down. Great, thank you. Mervyn? Yes. Well, in the state of Utah, I know that there is no, um, no documentation that I am aware of of a correlation between students in, in the school, students in the seats, uh, before we went to a green cleaning program or anybody went to a green cleaning program or after. Uh, so that's a question that quite often is, is asked by folks. They really want to know, uh, does this make an impact on the amount of uh, students you have? The answer is, we don't know. I don't know that anybody knows. But what I can tell you is this. The impact that it has had is very similar to what Deb had said earlier, that we do know that we are not exposing our children to certain toxic chemicals. We are not exposing our employees to certain toxic chemicals. And we are, uh, we are using chemicals that are more environmentally friendly. And that's, that's huge. So those parts I can speak to, but as far as uh, is there a direct correlation with the uh, impact having students in the seats, uh, no, there is not. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then another question for Mervyn, what are the preventative procedures that your teachers take in the classroom to prevent pests? That was something you mentioned briefly during the presentation, and we had a couple questions come in wanting to more information on that. Fabulous question. One of the things we have done besides training the custodial staff is we have gone through and trained part of integrated pest management includes everybody. It includes everybody being educated, everybody being a, uh, an, observant, uh, an observant person to report pest activity. And how that was handled was through training. As custodial supervisors, we went to schools, uh, their um, uh, faculty meetings, and we trained the teachers on how to identify pests, how to get on our website that we have uh, where pests can be reported. We also put out certain periodicals from our department. Uh, one of them is known as Fresh Paint, which is a newsletter article that talks about things that are going on in the facilities department. And there is uh, articles in there about pest identification. So the teachers have received a certain level of training on how to identify pests and how to report them. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then we have another question just wanting to know what are quaternary cleaners? I know Deb mentioned those in her presentation. Uh, those, are the clean, those are the disinfectants that actually um, can will kill the germs. That is why they cannot be called uh, green at this point because they're considered pesticides because after all, germs are bugs. Viruses are bugs. So we're, in trying to eliminate them, we still at this point in the game need to use some disinfectants that have specific kill claims. Um, you can read those on the quaternary disinfectant containers, it, it should tell you whether, you know, there's certain products that kill everything and then there are other certain, which would be the, um, then there, the other ones clean specific illnesses. There's some that are strictly for hep C and HIV and um, that type of thing. Then there are others that might have a specific MRSA claim or a specific rhinovirus claim. Many of them claim have high kill claims for several different things, but just make sure that what it is that you're up against is what that disinfectant has a kill claim for, and just to make sure you follow the directions as far as dwell time and keeping the areas um, saturated with the disinfectant. And, and the one other area I would like to add that is proper use in terms of personal protective gear in certain instances. Um, using using quads is actually appropriate in the school setting when you need to use disinfectants, but it's also not. There, there is no silver magical bullet when it comes to disinfectants and environmental uh, issues, and there are still exposure risks um, using these types of disinfectants. Right, and that's why we target it for only certain. We always only use it in targeted areas, or we increase the usage when there there is an outbreak. It is not something we use on a daily basis everywhere throughout the school except for um, in our health center. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. 
Another question we have is, either of you use antimicrobial coating? We currently do not. Okay. No, we, we do not either. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and the Healthy Schools campaign, we haven't really taken a strong position on the use of antimicrobial coatings, but we have been cautious about them. Um, we believe for cleaning and, and disinfectant when and where necessary is adequate. And our, one of our concerns is even with antimicrobial coatings, have the concern, um, you have the concern of an antimicrobial coating only works if it's clean. So it doesn't reduce the need for, for appropriate ongoing clean. Our concern is that if you have the, one of our concerns is the cautionary principle and what are there going to be exposures down the road that we don't currently understand. But more to the point, is this going to make people feel less vigilant and feel like we don't need to clean as much and we don't have to be as vigilant against protecting against germs and uh, I, we, we think there could be some unintended consequences. So we are very cautiously um, approaching this subject. Great, thank you. Um, and can either of you speak to what sanitizers you use on food contact surfaces? Deb, you'd probably have to do that because that is handled by our uh, child nutrition program and they are not a part of our uh, custodial cleaning program. Right. Um, no, we, we use the, um, the disinfectants in a, a ready to, not a ready to use, in a, a dilution control system that we have metered and measured by our vendors to meet a specific level of disinfectant that we can use on um, the tables that the, the children are um, at. Presently we have a um, camp and an extended school year program over at, at Clearpool and there are over 500 kids coming in and out of this one small building sitting on the same tables day, day in and day out. So we need to make sure that we keep those areas disinfected. Um, sanitizing the hydrogen peroxide is really becoming um, more and more used. Uh, it's the same type of thing that your mom used to use when you had a cut and pour it on and it bubbles. It does the same thing when you're cleaning. Um, again, you have to follow proper procedures. Um, and you should also look at the directions as to whether the, what you are using is appropriate for a food grade area. Yeah. And, and, and I'll throw out that uh, in our Quick and Easy Guide to Green Cleaning Schools, we have a section specific to green um, to food service. Mm -hmm. And we are currently flushing that out to expand it. And in the early part of 2013, we are going to be releasing our guide for a green food service program. That's not just, um, it will go into cleaning, operations, procurement, waste management, uh, as well as food production. So um, I, I, I look forward to being able to share that at the early part of next year. I do want to add one more thing. We do use a lot of enzymes and uh, bacterial type of di digesters in our kitchen to keep our fo floors clean and um, our drains clear. And uh, we, we have found that the enzymes work really well in keeping Great, down. Thank you. Um, so we're going to take one more question. There are a handful of other questions, um, but we want to be respectful of your time. And if your question isn't answered, we'll be sure um, to have ask it of our a panelist and send you a response. Um, so the final question is, as a distributor, we are told green products are too expensive and don't work as well by our customers. What made Debra and Mervyn make the changes they did? So if you guys can speak to what made you decide to Definitely. implement your green cleaning program. Our cleaning budget, uh, our supply budget, has not gone up at all in the last decade. What we found that we had to do is we had to do away with products such as bleach, which were very inexpensive, um, and some other products, and implement a, uh, in, in our green system something that uh, up front looked to cost more money. However, if you, that's all you do is change a chemical, then yeah, you'll spend more money. But if you change a process, if you find a way to do something that saves time, that, uh, and, and there's other factors as well that I uh, don't have the time to go into right now, but you can actually save money. In fact, by going to our hydrogen peroxide cleaner, which by the way we use as a window cleaner, we use as a hard surface uh, floor cleaner, we use it in our restrooms, we use it on our carpets, we use it just about everywhere. 
we found that the car diluted gallon of that cleaner is much less than some of the other cleaners that we were using in the past. So it actually cost us less to go green. I think the dilution control um, that you just mentioned, Merv, I think that's one big component that I don't think vendors are really um, explaining if they are against that type of thing. They want to go with RTU, ready to use, which is more bottles, more water, more transportation costs. You really don't need that. Again, up front, you might need a dilution uh, system installed, but your vendor should be able to take care of that for you without with minimal upfront cost. And um, by using proper, proper dilution rates, your staff are not pouring half a gallon of a cleaner into a gallon into the mop bucket and then spreading it all over the place um, because that's not effective. More is not better. More can be toxic. And also, yeah, it's much it's much easier to train. It's it's much more uh, uniform, as you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, run into this scenario before that uh, you'll have a custodian in building A that will use two ounces per gallon, but the custodian in building B thinks that four or six ounces per gallon will work a whole lot better. Exactly. So that just uh, throws your economy right down the tube. With the dilution control stations that we have and these green products, we really are able to save money. Agreed. Great, fantastic. I think that's a good note to end on. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you so much to our presenters for sharing the wonderful work you're both doing in your school. Um, and please, uh, for participants out there, free to join us for the additional webinars that we have on this summer. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.